What I wanted to do is bring up a few other people that really know a lot about these topics and to you know, ask them a couple questions. But I also want you guys to think of areas that you'd like to, to know about. We're going to have time for a few questions as well. So I'd like to bring up, first of all, Dr. Ronald Hoffman, uh, a storied veteran uh, of the integrated medicine world. Uh, DrHoffman.com slash podcast is the best place to go for the integrated uh, intelligent medicine podcast. Dr. Ronald Hoffman here. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Reed Winnick, who is uh, one of the top biological dentists in the world, a sustainable dentist, and has some unbelievably interesting information about germs, and is going to be sharing it from a dental perspective. I've got Dr. Robin Berzin, uh, who is a host of Varia Living Companion, works in Dr. Morrison Center, and um, is, a, uh, is a, an MD, and we're going to be talking to her a little bit later about technology as well. Welcome, Dr. Berzin. And you can't have a germ panel without Dr. Polevsky, so here he is back here. <laughs> so, the first question is for you, Dr. Hoffman. So, my mother didn't go to university. She grew up in South Africa. I was the weird kid at school who had chiropractic and homeopathy. <laughs> and, and yet, when I was at school in the, in the sort of like the late 80s, I was the only kid at school and they, I was told that I wasn't allowed to have antibiotics. My mum was very clear on this. How did my mum know about this 30 years ago and the CDC is catching up this year? Well, in the day, I think she was a visionary. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell her you said that. Recognizing that. You know, it reminds me of uh, the movie Slumdog Millionaire. You know, there's yeah. a scene where uh, the kid gets tricked into, into sitting on the toilet where they're, you know, it gets dropped into the muck in India in this, this uh, abattoir, this uh, toilet that uh, is so toxic with all the germs. And so my, you know, as a, as a holistic physician, my immediate thought was if this kid survives that experience, He's going to have the best immune system imaginable. <laughs> yeah. And I actually have a, a friend who's a veterinarian, and he never gets sick. He gets his aches and pains, but he never gets infectious diseases. And I say, you know, Bob, why is it that you never get sick? And he said, well, I had an experience when I was growing up on the farm. Uh, I once uh, was, I was playing in the barn, and I slipped and fell into a pile of manure, and I went down head first. <laughs> and ever since then, I mean, that, that's, that's a, epitomizes, that, that's the hygiene hypothesis. Yeah. It was a rebirth, right? Yeah, that's exactly. That's the, the Dwight Schrutian approach. Um, you put a lot of, you've had great guests on your show uh, at the Intelligent Medicine podcast, and you put awesome stuff on your, on your site. Looking at all the germ research that's come out in the last couple of years, uh, I know that we've talked about crosstalk and the way that microbes are actually educating the immune system. What would you say are some of the most interesting things that you've, that you've been seeing, keeping on, on track of everything that's going on? Well, I think one of the most interesting uh, new themes in this is psychobiotics, is the notion that uh, bacteria have an impact on mood. And Dr. Polevsky, Larry, has really opened my eyes to the possibility that viruses may participate in that. Because we tend to think of viruses, well, those are always bad. Uh, but they may, you know, a lot of insights in that, in that great talk. Uh, that your bacterial uh, environment has an impact on the brain via a variety of mechanisms that obviously the gut elaborates a lot of the neurotransmitters that you have. Uh, you have a brain in your gut, makes uh, serotonin and other uh, active peptides which have an impact on the brain. Uh, so literally you can change mood uh, by altering your intestinal flora. I think this is a fascinating new uh, insight. It's actually been demonstrated in uh, experiments with animals, animals where they develop autistic-like behaviors uh, that can be turned on and off with administration of the proper probiotics. Yeah. And I, I, this is just a, an emerging new field. I'm not sure if that was an intentional plug for next month, which is all on mental health. Yeah. We've got uh, Dr. Kelly Brogan come back. She's already had thousands of views on our YouTube channel of her talk, What Functional Medicine Does to Your Brain, last month. If you haven't seen it, check it out. She'll be back. Dr. Jeff Morrison, Dr. Paul Epstein. We've got a great lineup, but that's next month. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Winnick, I just want to ask you about germs because if there's one thing we all knew about germs growing up, it was the commercials, right, with the Listerine where you'd take it and it would show all the little germs and bad they're doing. Do you see any 
I, we're going to go out. Do you see any evidence in dentistry that there's a symbiotic relationship that having less germs in the mouth is not necessarily the best thing? Um, we do, and there's, there's actually um, research pending publication that shows that the nitric oxide pathway also starts in the mouth using bacteria. It converts nitrates, and it's a whole, that's where it starts. Um, if you're not familiar with nitric oxide, nitric oxide is important for endothelial cell function, which is really important for the integrity of every blood vessel in the body. And the theory in this article that's coming out is that by taking these mouthwashes, you're killing the bacteria that's needed to produce this nitric oxide. So in regard, then, you might be harming your heart by sterilizing your mouth. Mm. That's awesome. So interesting. And you've, uh, you were the first dentist to get the chair at the Integrated Health Symposium in the main room, and you talked about germs in the mouth being a barometer for germs in the gut. Do you mm -hmm. want to just go into that a little bit? Because I think that's an interesting window into the, into the body. Sure. Um, I think we all know that the uh, microbiome project has proven that we're just teeming with extra microbes. And these microbes make up an ecosystem similar to the ecosystem that we see also in our Earth. And it's my feeling that since we're all from this Earth, then the mouth and the body really follow the healthy, sustainable principles that govern nature. So as an example, if you look at a tree, the strength of a tree really comes from its root system. If a tree, let's say, gets acidic water, what happens is we see breakdown of the leaves at the top of the tree. Well, similar if we look at our body, our intestines are really our roots. And the foundation and the strength of our immune system come from our intestine, similar to the tree, which are the roots. But if the body becomes too acidic, we see a ch change in these microbes and then the body starts to decay. And we start seeing decay affect the teeth. And it, my premise is, well, the teeth become brown and they become decayed just like the leaves on a tree do. So what happens is, if it was a tree, we just pick off the leaves. Well, what's happening today and for, for all the years past is my colleagues are just looking at the teeth, which are really the leaves of a tree, and they're spending more time extracting these teeth, spending all this time trying to develop plants to put in implants. But they're not really getting to the cause of the problem. They're not working on the strength of the body or the vital force of the body by working on the immune system through the, through the gut. And what happens is the mouth really is becoming, to me, the barometer for overall well, uh, health. And the mouth is a predictor of disease. So if you see breakdown in the mouth first, you can bet years later you'll see breakdown in the rest of the body. Awesome. I just got one more question because I know this is your sort of party trick for, for everyone here. But why shouldn't we be flossing? The answer is why should we be flossing? <laughs> um, first of all, there's pr this probably gets me the most emails. And either people are so thrilled to hear that I'm telling them not to floss, or they're saying, that you're crazy, how do you not floss? First of all, if you want to floss, you might guess, floss. <laughs> all right. There you go, floss. <laughs> she used to be. <laughs> Different rules for people she on uh, TV. You have to floss. It's part of the contract for uh, the TV. She used to be a hygienist. <laughs> um, the reality is if you have food caught in your teeth, flossing is great. The reality is if your teeth are healthy, flossing is great. But what's happening is so many patients are being told when they have gum disease, which means they have now pocketing between the teeth, and they're saying, well, you better go home and floss. There's a bad infection at the bottom of that pocket. That's where the biofilm is. 
and the pathogens are, it's impossible to get floss in the bottom of that pocket. Floss is not antimicrobial. So what's happening is everyone is being told to do something that really isn't going to work anyhow. So why are they told to do it? Plus, 75% of Americans know they should floss. Only 35% do floss. So we try to educate the public and our patients that you, you're better off doing something that's easier, like using a water pick or a hydrofloss that will flush the base of the pocket and help get rid of the infection that's causing the gum disease in the first place. Thank you, Dr. Winnick. Can I move on to you, Robin? Dr. Burzin here. Um, you are you know, a few years out of medical school. I just want to know what it was like being in medical school, reading the textbooks when the science on this was changing dramatically. Um, great question. It, it doesn't move fast in med school, at least not where I went to med school. Uh, so, you know, they thinking about the microbiome, thinking about the kinds of ways to address the microbiome, and even thinking about how the microbiome is influencing health was not something that we really learned much about. And I think I'm dredging, you know, the backs and depths of my brain to get back to microbiome. But um, I guess we were aware that there were bacteria in the gut, but thinking about them clinically was not something we were doing. And so much of medical school and medical education is hospital-based, so you're just thinking so much about these very sick people. I went to med school at Columbia in New York City, and it's a you know tertiary quaternary care center. The people who are actually hospitalized in that kind of place are very, very sick, um, very, very complicated patients. And you're not really think about thinking as much about the way people are living. You're thinking about these highly controlled factors of somebody who's in the hospital setting. And so, unfortunately, I think medical education suffers from that because we don't think as much about how people are living, people as outpatients, and what that means for our education. So we're not always as on top of things that are changing in the medical literature when it comes to uh, kind of everyday health as we are and things that might have to do with, you know, what's happening in what kind of surgery you might need or in an ICU kind of setting. And then trans transmitting into a practice, going to functional medicine training, learning a, a little bit about it. Let's be sure, like at IHS last year, there was an awesome talk on the microbiome, but there were three other talks going on at the same time, and there was about 50 people in there. A little bit disconcerting. You know, now you've done some functional medicine training, and now going into practice, what now? Like, when you understand you have these two competing information, and even not two, but maybe more, what are you doing with the person in front of you who says, oh, you know, I think I've got an acute infection or, you know, those kind of things. How do you, how do you help to deal with that in the moment when, like, the, the person knows what they think they want? What do you do then? Um, I mean, it's definitely a process of educating people. I mean, doing the IFM's, you know, GI course was completely enlightening for me in terms of everything that's happening in the gut and the fact that health starts in the gut. And that was eye-opening eye for me, even though I already knew something about the microbiome. So... For me, I love talking to patients about it because it's always a re-education process for me. I kind of get to like relearn it every time and think about it um, and help them think about how we're starting in the gut and we're working our way out and how that's such a key factor in their health, health no matter whether they're dealing with Lyme disease, whether they're dealing with an autoimmune disease, whether they're dealing with cancer, whether they're dealing with something more acute, that we can't tackle it effectively unless we address that part of them. And uh, I think it's empowering for people to realize that because it's one way that they can think about the way that they're living and what they're doing and how they can influence their health optimally beyond even what I can do for them. That's great, thank you. Dr. P, you spoke a lot about kids today. How do you transpose that to, because surely the buildup of waste over all the time, with all of those factors you look at, why aren't all of us all sick all the time? How do you know we're not? I mean, I think we probably are. Well, the thing is that, the, the thing is that, that each person's constitution will manifest their symptoms in the part of their body where they're most susceptible. So, you know, when I see kids with asthma and I see kids with eczema, the pulmonologist would say the problem's in the lungs, and the dermatologist would say the problem's in the skin. And then if I see kids with autism, uh, the developmental pediatrician will say that the problem's in the nervous system. And in fact, all three kids are the same. The problem is the underlying issue, which is an overburden of inflammatory materials that are manifesting in the place where they most find their route to exit the body. So I think when you start to see one in six children with neurodevelopmental delays in this country, when you start to see one in 10 children with uh, asthma, which has tripled since 1980, when you start to see um, the rates of food allergies, which are not only 
increasing exponentially, but fatal allergies, which are uh, increasing exponentially. You see the number of adults that are uh, developing neurodegenerative disorders. You see the rapid rise of autoimmune diseases in this country, including celiac disease and this sort of nebulous non-celiac gluten sensitivity, maybe wheat sensitivity, but not gluten sensitivity. So you, you start to see all these permutations and the, the bottom line is that we're the sickest country in the world with chronic inflammatory conditions and we're supposed to have the best healthcare in the world. And so when you start breaking down the model that I showed you, you know, genetics in utero, air, skin, nervous system, diet, uh, injections, you, in spirit, you start to realize that there's a whole lot of stuff coming in that's not finding its way out. And, you know, in, at least in my practice, when I take a history, I'll, I'll hear, oh yeah, this one has Crohn's disease, this one has ulcerative colitis, this one has thyroiditis, Hashimoto's, this one, I have a nephew with autism, yeah, I had ADD when I was a kid, um, yeah, we have a family history of allergies, we have a, I mean, you can't take a family history anymore without hearing the level of chronic inflammatory conditions. So I don't, I don't agree with your premise that we're not all sick. I think we're all accepting that living with one in six kids with neurodevelopmental disabilities is normal. And living with kids with one in 10 asthma is, oh, we just you know, accept it. And when I was training in medical school and residency, an 18 month old would have 50 words and a two year old would have over 100 words with two word sentences. Well now, pediatricians are telling parents that if a child at two has 20 words, that's normal. So we're lowering the bar for just about everything. And it's not normal. It's normally accepted, but it's not normal. The word that Kelly Brogan used last week, last month, was that we're devolving. Um, in that we're sort of going backwards, and that would sort of um, uh, fit in with that. I'd say. Would you? Well, I think the I think you know the studies. If you just look at the studies showing the the um, fatty acid composition of the human brain, you'll see that there's there's increasing amounts of fats that what what used to be seen in the more prehistoric man. And I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, telling people to give their kids dairy, um, because you can only manifest the the brain of a cow by drinking the breast milk of a cow. You can't manifest the brain of a human, which needs different fatty acid composition. And so that's I think is a part of it. But the other part is that, you know, there's a ton of toxicity that we're offering into children, um, starting in utero, and then as soon as they become alive and breathing, they're, they're exposed to a tremendous toxicity, which then continues um, in 95 plus percent of the population. So you can't inject neurotoxins into the body and then question why so many kids are motor delayed and speech delayed and can't process, can't sit still. You can't keep doing that to a nervous system and then say, what's going on? I got one last question, then we'll have a couple questions from the audience. So if you've got some, some things that you want to ask the panel. Most practitioners in here are not developing, are not providing the type of medicine that you're talking about right now. There's obviously got to be a journey, because I, I mean, I believe in what you're saying to such a degree that my child is in your care. <laughs> what, for the physicians who are looking to maybe move along this journey because they've heard some truth tonight that they feel like, What's the next step? Like, what do you do tomorrow or on the next day that starts moving you along in this direction? Well, from, from my perspective, it's about making a paradigm shift. Because a lot, I mean, and this is not a judgment. I mean, everyone is where they need to be along the, you know, the spectrum of learning. But to me, a paradigm shift needs to see disease from a totally different perspective and needs to see the human body from a state of wellness, not from a state of disease treatment. And so I don't, I don't see the symptoms that I see as something wrong. I have to interpret them to find a way for the parents to try to recognize that something is trying to become right. And so that's an ideological shift from the way conventional medicine is practiced. And what's interesting is that every field of medicine, except Western medicine, embodies the concept that the body has the innate capacity to heal. Western medicine is the only one. So the only way for medical doctors 
to start practicing, is to start going back to the basic sciences of the body. Look at the ologies. Look at the immunologies, the neurologies. I mean, yeah, it would be great to have seminars for thousands of doctors. You know, Institute of Functional Medicine is trying to do that, but it's still, in my opinion, and it's, it's a great, great forum, but it's still based on disease treatment a lot. And I think we have to start looking at the paradigm shift that says, you know, uh, how do we keep the body from getting sick? Not how, because parents ask me all the time, well, how do I, how do I keep my kid's immune system strong? Well, it, 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 it's already strong. It, how do you keep it, how do you prevent it from weakening? And so again, it's a paradigm shift. And we have to stop running around trying to, you know, plug up problems with symptoms and start to maintain a real wellness program that isn't about putting out fires. And that's, you know, that's what we were trained to do as doctors, put out fires. And instead of putting it out with a drug, now we're putting it out with homeopathy or we're putting it out with, um, you know, an herb. But that's still not the paradigm shift that I think we need to go to. And I think there's plenty of people who are begging for the ability to make that paradigm shift. I don't know any forum that provides that paradigm shift, but certainly there's enough of us who are smart enough to be able to put it together. Well, there is a new forum in town, Larry. It's funny you should say that. <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> Look, let's face the basics here.